I think I've made it abundantly clear just how much I despise the main protagonist of this show. Her attitudes, her characterization, her voice, her simultaneous aimlessness combined with self-entitlement. Reprehensible is the fitting term. I've had less to say about the other members of the main quartet, but that's because there hasn't been much focus on them as of yet. But suffice to say, they aren't much better. In fact, while I have already thoroughly expressed just how much I absolutely loathe the writing of this show, especially the character work, especially the protag, and I'll naturally keep doing so, there's still a long way to go. I feel like, before we move any further, there is a single burning question that needs to be answered. Can we use the most offensive of slurs to describe the characters of this show? Is the script truly that awful? Have the writers committed the gravest of sins? Have they summoned the dark eldritch abomination that should never be invoked? The character type I'm talking about is naturally the dreaded, the awful, the lamest of the lame, Mary Sue. Now usually, the Mary Sue or Gary Stu archetype is used as a shorthand to describe characters who embody many if not all of the classic mistakes of amateurish character writing, the hilarious fanfiction-y insert s qualities. Notably, these characters are the best at what they do, usually with no realistic justification, they never struggle, they have no flaws, everyone loves them, the narrative is vehemently and artificially focused on them, the entire world revolves around them, and absolutely nothing gets done narrative-wise without their direct input. They are beautiful, powerful, the coolest, the smartest, absolutely perfect in every way. And even if they end up having any flaws at all, it's always some variety of bullshit fake non-flaws. These include things like clumsiness, fear of their own overwhelming strength, or tepid self-doubt, which is just silly considering their godly skill. The author basically creates a wish-fulfillment fantasy in the most shallow, boring and obnoxious way possible. The problem with these types of characters is obvious. Struggle is conflict, conflict is stakes, stakes are drama, and drama is the one thing that makes the audience give a damn about your story. Flawless characters carry no drama, and hence, no investment. Why should I care about any alleged dramatic turn of events, when I know that the protag has zero chance of failure? The Marisu title is an effective way to compress the audience's disdain towards shite character work. It's a useful term, if a tad of a misnomer. There are a bunch of qualities often associated with the Marisu, some of them more prominent than others. I actually made a handy bingo card of it. However, it is important to note that none of these attributes automatically make a character into a Su, nor does the lack of any of these automatically abolish a character from being a Su. It's a malleable term. It's more effective in expressing the audience's views on a given character, rather than an objective assessment of their qualities on a rigid good-bad scale. It all depends on what kind of story is being told, and how prominent the Marisu-ness is. Example, many Rule of Cool stories definitely have an overpowered, omnicapable lead character, someone who just steamrolls the competition, but in the context of such stories, that can be entertaining in its own right. Dumb fun. It's not deep or complex, but it's also not bad per se. Far as I see it, the truest trait of a Marisu story is the total lack of self-awareness. The author creates a perfect being into a universe where nothing can truly hurt them, and then pretends like the story is filled with high stakes and drama, as if their wish-fulfillment character is actually just another relatable average person. As a fast rule of thumb, you cannot tell a serious story with an overly capable slash flawless character. All of that being said, how does High Guardian Spice fare on this front? 
the characters suck, no use pretending otherwise. But are any of them truly Mary Sue's? Well, let's take a closer look at the girl's first day of school, and maybe we can find an answer to this question. First up, Sage. So at this point, the show introduces the central aspect of Sage's character. Namely, the inadequacy she feels related to her magical abilities. In short, the magic in the show's universe is categorized into two groups, old magic and new magic. The current reigning style of sorcery is new magic, which is activated by using these magical doohickeys known as terraspheres. These allow the wielder to do basically anything at no cost whatsoever, which is utterly broken, as I have already discussed. God, I fucking hate this fucking show! They are never properly explained by the show, which is ironic, considering the entire story takes place in a freaking school. Something that is also never explained is the relation of old magic to the new. What's the cost of old magic? What are the rules? How did it lead into the creation of the new system? The show claims that the old is the basis for the new system, so how did that come about? A dozen episodes, and I have no idea. The conflict here is supposed to be the following. Sage has never been able to wield new magic before, because her parents are devoted traditionalists, I guess? And only tolerate the old magic. For some reason. So she is supposedly at a disadvantage in an environment where the primary field of study is new magic. She is even made fun of for this by Amaryllis, her very own Draco Malfoy if you will. This is supposed to be Sage's primary conflict in the show. Her relation to her parents, their traditional ways, coming to terms with her own attitudes towards magic, overcoming her status as an underdog, all the while studying to be the best mate she can be. The way I've laid it out is already giving the show too much credit, because the story actually explores none of that. The whole premise itself makes absolutely no sense for several obvious reasons. Firstly, why the hell would anyone in this world scoff at new magic, and insist on using the old? New magic can literally do anything with no cost. Think of it like this. Why would anyone in modern society insist on using typewriters instead of a computer in their day-to-day -day work? That would be absolutely retarded. The benefits of modern technology are too cost-effective to ignore. The show never elaborates on the whole traditionalist aspect of Sage's parents. There's no philosophy, no religious doctrine to justify it. So the only way anyone can view them is a couple of drooling morons. Secondly, why should anyone feel inadequate for not being already learned in a subject that they have just begun studying? The purpose of school is to learn, not to show off how much you already know. This is basic stuff. All of this is completely backwards. And thirdly, despite Sage never having wielded new magic before, she is already extremely powerful. She can literally fly. That is not a small thing. That is already amazing beyond all comprehension. The average person can't even dream of flying, even in this fantastical world. Sage is good enough for her age and level of study. More than good enough. She should know that as well. You can never convince me otherwise. In any case... The episode desperately tries to create an arc of sorts for Sage. She gets picked on for being lame, even though there has yet to be any practical tests of skill, just introductions to courses, but whatever. So she goes crying to Rosemary, <laughs> I cannot do it. And Rosemary gives her a big ol' serving of validation. Sage, listen, okay? You're a hundred thousand times better than all of those jerks. You belong here so much that, that, that I heard the triad talk about making doppelgangers of you just so they could have more of you. And guess what? I'm not letting you go until you agree. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're just so great. And when 
when you don't think you're great, it makes me so sad. Well, I can't make you sad. Exactly. <laughs> this whole thing in itself is a primary suit trait. Constant validation, even when the character has done nothing to deserve it. The sprinklings of victimization are important too. I mean, how else is the audience supposed to relate to the character and root for them? Making them likable and interesting? <laughs> what a joke. Everyone knows something like that is far too much for this show's budget. So after the codling pep talk, Sage buckles up and showcases her skills in the coming potions class. The teacher poisons the entire class and leaves them to struggle for survival with zero instructions. While everyone else is just screaming and dashing about like the newbies that they are, Sage is the only one who even tries to fix up the potion needed for everyone not to die. This school fucking sucks by the by. So the new magic of Amaryllis and the other students amounts to nothing. Is that what we are supposed to gather here? No, it's never painted in that light, even though it's hideously obvious. Sage did better with her quote-unquote old-fashioned and obsolete magic, compared to the modern wizards with practically infinite power. In the context new magic is described, everyone here should be able to simply wish the poison away or something like that. None of this makes sense. Sage was supposed to be the underdog here, and yet she leaves everyone in her class to bite her dust within the first day of school. This is the defining moment. This is the thing that solidifies Sage's status in the story. First day of school, top of her class. She has no growth ahead of her. She is already better than everyone else. Moreover, everyone who teases her are made to look like idiots and everyone the show deems as nice and good are constantly praising her, so that she and the audience knows for absolute certainty just how special she is. Sounds like a Marisu to me! <laughs> Moving on to Parsley. Zinya! Here! Parsley. Parsley? <laughs> Parsley, I am here. Mm, okay, good. Um, you can start by sitting down. I can do that. Okay, this is the point where this show's sense of humor is really starting to piss me off. This gag makes no sense. In the scene prior to this one, Parsley is the one on the level. She is the one in the know about all the goings on in the school. And now she is suddenly late from class. How? How come no one else is late? Everyone here is a first day student. So in this huge school, where no one is apparently guiding the students into their classrooms, on the first day, everyone else managed to find the classroom on time, except Parsley. That doesn't follow any kind of logic. Ugh. And the punchline isn't even that amusing. Effective comedy is a surefire way to win the audience to your side. Viewers may forgive a lacking story if the characters are at least charming and make them laugh. But if you try to force comedy and end up botching it, it only creates further resentment. A flat gag is painful to witness. Moreover, it leads into broken characterization as with Sage, as with Rosemary. Anyway, cringy comedy aside, how does Parsley fare on her first day? Well, how do you think? She is the bestest in her class. In fact, she outclasses everyone to such a degree that the teacher immediately moves her to the third year class. Bullshit! Is what I would say, except... The show does in fact have a justification for this. See, Parsley has been working in her family-owned blacksmith shop her whole life. So of course she's ahead in her studies. If anything, the problem here is the fact that the teacher isn't aware of this already. 
it is stated several times in the show that the students are handpicked for their capabilities. We welcome you, our first year students, and commend you for being chosen. You've each been selected for your exceptional qualities. And yet the academy has no clue what the students' capabilities are. These two things cannot be true simultaneously. How are the applicants appraised? When did it happen? Why does Sage angst about not being good enough if she has been handpicked to attend the academy? How did a dumbass like Rosemary make the cut? Was it nepotism? I don't know. The show never explains anything. It's not just a plot hole, it's a plot black hole. A supermassive black hole, if you will. Back on track. Contrasting parsley next to sage is actually an excellent way to illustrate the difference between a Mary Sue and a character who is simply capable. Parsley has a clear reason for why she's better than everyone else. More importantly, the show never pretends like Parsley is an average person, let alone an underdog. Writing-wise, the Mary Sue lacks self-awareness, while the Not Sue simply follows cause and effect. Now it is important to note that this does not mean that Parsley is a well-written character just because she ain't a Mary Sue. Due to her mastery of smithing, she really has nowhere to go. There's no development ahead of her. She has no reason to exist. She has no arc and no personality to be entertaining on her own. All her scenes amount to her just smithing away or delivering some forgettable dialogue with the other gals which could be accomplished just as easily with anyone else from the overly stuffed cast. She is a useless, boring addition to the roster. All of her scenes could be cut, and the show would remain exactly the same. There is nothing to her character. The show tries to give her some tired family drama in episode 4, and we'll get to that at a later point. For now, suffice to say it's a wee bit shit. So congratulations Parsley, you are not a Mary Sue, but you are still a worthless character. Up next is Fime. Haven't talked about her much yet. So what is the Dark Elf up to on her first day of school? What kind of journey is the show crafting for her? That's it. No, seriously. The staring contest with this one random cat is her entire contribution to the story in this episode. Riveting! Now, in the deranged heads of the dumbass writing staff, this here is supposed to be foreshadowing, and I'm using that term extremely loosely. The black kitty with the menacing stare is actually secretly a girl with a menacing stare. Ooh. She is the primary villain of the show. More on that later. I just... I just can't right now. Hilariously enough, this scene is actually a perfect microcosm of Fime's contribution to the show. She is just there. She is the cool, semi-aloof, bow-wielding elf of this band of heroes. Because every band of heroes needs a cool, semi-aloof, bow-wielding elf. Fantasy! As for Mary Sue-ness, I don't think it's justified to call her one. She never misses with her bow, sure. She never struggles to do anything in general, yeah, but still. I guess it's the show's lack of focus on her. She just exists as someone who occasionally shoots things with her bow. And she's not made to feel overly special. She never actually accomplishes anything significant on her own, only as a part of the group. Her motivation later on in the show centers around the magical plague taking over the land, which is not really exclusive to her, since, you know, a looming apocalypse is everyone's problem. She also has some sort of feud with her family, much like Parsley, which we'll get to. Suffice to say, it's also a wee bit shit. On her own, Fime is basically an angsty tree hugger. 
She broods, she scoffs, she tells the dumbasses around her to piss off, so that's a plus in my book. I just wish she did more of that. Being a guardian can kill you. They just say that stuff about death to scare people who aren't willing to do the work. No, they don't. They say you might die because you might die. In a vacuum, I probably tolerate FIME the most out of the main quartet, but that assessment comes with a huge asterisk. The only thing that elevates her above the others is that she is allowed to say things as they are, and not just shower her classmates with undue validation. After she eventually stops doing that, she becomes just another lame gal in the group. And finally, as for Rosemary, is she truly a Mary Sue? Yes! A thousand times yes! I already went over how utterly garbage her character is. But just to reiterate, because this is the main protag we are talking about, so this shit is infinitely important, she is the special child of a special legendary hero. She has her special sword, she is somehow able to wield it with her noodle arms. She is a fighting protege, surviving encounters with not one, but two more experienced villains in her first year of training. And she fights while wearing a pink frilly hoop skirt dress for fuck's sake. She never fails truly, and every time the show tries to showcase her struggling, it never amounts to anything significant story-wise. This here, this, this is nothing. It means nothing. A moment of stumbling without self-reflection, humility and development is empty. It's cheating. Rosemary never grows because she never has to grow. She is everything the writers wish to be. She is selfish, inconsiderate, rash, Loud, stupid beyond belief, and yet she's treated like the most important person in the whole world by the show and the cast. Her friends allow her to be awful, teachers take special interest in her, the only trope she lacks is the villains literally falling in love with her. If this show had even a hint of realism, any kind of stakes, then a person like Rosemary would be dead dozen times over. She would never even be accepted into High Guardian Academy. On the other hand, the school's curriculum seems to be aiming to train a future generation of sociopaths. So at least that checks out. I hope this helps illustrate that the Marisu is not an all-encompassing term when it comes to character descriptions. There's more nuance than many people care to think about. Lackluster characters are bad in their own right. The Marisu spice on top of that is simply that extra insult from the author that makes stories like this so special. Short bus special.